So um, I'm, a, I'm kind of in, should be here, but I'm slightly oblique to everything that has been said here. I think I fall into the, uh, probably the last talk uh, niche, uh, which is sort of the rhetorical aspect of bathing. In other words, a lot of people are doing research uh, about bathing or they're, they're uh, involved with running uh, bathing establishments. But uh, I have been, in my involvement with bathing, it was the communication aspect of what the bathing experience is about, except not a film. I did it in uh, print media. And um, basically, I, I write books and uh, design them about uh, uh, um, about art and uh, design, aesthetics. It doesn't seem to be working. You know why? Because this is a Wait a second. There. Okay. Give it one second. There we go. Okay. I'm not going to talk to you about these books, but the, my most recent book is um, about a project I did from 1976 to 1981. It was called Wet Magazine. And... Um, oh, wait, how many of you in this room have heard of Wet Magazine? This is, I mean, this is a classic magazine. Yeah. You have what? The first copy, all right. Good. Cool. Good. So this is what I look like. I just graduated from uh, graduate architecture school. And in graduate architecture school, I was very, uh, I, I gravitated towards uh, small, intimate environments. And I became very interested in the Japanese uh, tea ceremony in the tea room. And I was looking for an environment that had fulfilled some of the same functions, purification, uh, equality among participants, uh, uh, meditative, quiet, etc. Um, and I realized that it was probably the bathroom was the most omnipresent, ubiquitous environment that we had in American culture. And so I wanted to explore these uh, similar environments in other cultures. Uh, I didn't want to practice architecture, so I became, uh, uh, I did bath art. I made bath art, which involved uh, getting uh, uh, friends to bathe for me in various environments. And sort of, I wanted to understand what people did, almost from an anthropological point of view, when they bathed. And I made these uh, uh, art pieces, for want of a better term, which I sold. This was a piece called, uh, two of the elements of a piece called Mud Bath. I, um, and I even ended up uh, making, uh, manufacturing shower curtains. This was the promotional uh, literature that, uh, that accompanied it. Um, and I wanted to repay the models who had modeled for all my various projects. Uh, so I rented an old Russian Jewish bathhouse, uh, an obscure area of Los Angeles. Uh, I lived in Venice, California at the time. And uh, the party was so successful it generated so much social energy because people really didn't know what to expect. Um, they didn't know how to dress. They didn't know what was going to go on. They'd never been to a facility like that. That um, I decided to, uh, I, ne I wanted to harness it, and I decided to start a magazine about gourmet bathing. I didn't know what gourmet bathing was exactly, <laughs> but um, it, it seemed to be the right combination of, uh, of words. And um, one thing I knew is there'd be unusual bathing environments. This was the third issue. Um, because I went to architecture school, a lot of my friends were architects. Uh, this was a model one of my friends did, uh, made of ice cubes and clay of a, for a public bath facility. Um, the building I lived in had this bath. It was an old gondola garage that was converted into an automotive garage, and the grease pit for the automotive garage was converted into the soaking trench. Um, the person who owned that also had a place in Costa Rica. Uh, this was the, the shower there. I was also interested in the um, collaboration of man and nature in bathing environments. Uh, also bathing from a sociological perspective. <laughs> Uh, also, the theoretical and speculative aspects of bathing. Wait, wait, uh, Leonard, sorry. Yeah. Did you go back to that one? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's a bathtub? Uh, yes. Uh, you've never been there? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, actually, um, what happened when, when wet uh, 
happen at a, well, there are various elements that came together, but basically it really piqued people's uh, imaginations and interests. It stimulated a lot of creative people. And um, uh, people who had obscure ideas would bring them to us. And um, if they, we thought that they were uh, sufficiently uh, interesting, we would uh, publish them. This is a person who did a series of bodies of water uh, in various uh, nooks and crannies of the body. This, this is, happened to be one of my favorite ones, but of course you can imagine the navel was another one and um, other places. And uh, the way he, he put those little uh, cross marks like it was a, uh, a map-like. And uh, does that answer your question? Anyway, it was but speculative they, and theoretical. You could have bathed in there. You could have bathed in there. If you were if, really if, tiny. In right? other words, if you are um, <laughs> architects and designers need inspiration. And uh, this would inspire somebody towards a, uh, maybe uh, suggestions of organic bathing forms. Uh, also, because we were living in Los Angeles, uh, bathing, Los Angeles has a, a bathing fantasy life all its own. That's something that we wanted to capture. We're also interested in bathing among uh, non-human life forms. <laughs> And wet, uh, because of the subject matter, the, uh, all the different elements, the light, the nudity, the, uh, the steam, the, the water, uh, uh, a lot of graphic designers gravitated towards uh, uh, to wet, wanted to work with us. And uh, wet became seminal in the development of what was called new wave or postmodern graphic design. And um, Sometimes the covers went a little far afield of bathing, but bathing was always part of it. Um, one, we, some of the people who were involved with WET went on to become illustrious in various fields. This was uh, a guy named Matt Groening who went on to create The Simpsons TV show, etc. Uh, he worked for WET for a long time, did in various functions. Um, some of the, uh, again, some of the features went a little far afield from bathing uh, proper, but there was a, with bathing, at least we, in our minds at the time, there was a, um, a related cultural agenda, and it had something to do with uh, a combination somewhere between the silly and the sublime, and uh, the sacred and the profane, and um, so we, we had articles that followed in that sensibility. Wet was uh, not entirely uh, uh, flip, though. Uh, we, we did have a reverence for natural resources, uh, including water, of course. And I think wet, in some ways, was prescient in this sense. We, we understood that water was going to be a big issue uh, 30 or 40 years in the future. Uh, wet became a, kind of a real business. And um, we real business has uh, a promotional aspects to it. And one of the ways that we found uh, the best ways to promote wet was uh, through our bath parties. So we went back and had more parties at the old Pico Burnside Baths, the Russian Jewish bathhouse. Um, we had uh, swimming pool parties in Beverly Hills. Uh, we had odd uh, wet events in, in New York and fashionable nightclubs. And we also made wet posters, and uh, we had our wet t-shirts. Um, also, uh, after a while, wet began to attract uh, Hollywood. Hollywood, because we published in LA, wet was fashionable. And um, we got uh, calls from uh, movie star agents saying, we, you know, Richard wants to be on the cover of, of your magazine. And, um, at first, I thought it was a bad idea, but uh, one of the people who worked there convinced me that it, we could try it for a while. So for about uh, a year, we had celebrity covers, and that worked pretty well. And WET became uh, extremely fashionable, and uh, I was invited to go to Tokyo and be in uh, TV ads for um, a department, hip department store chain. This was a plexiglass uh, bathtub that actually broke because uh, 
uh, they'd used warm water, and so then the next time it was cold water, and uh, you know, smile. And <laughs> but um, by 1981, the learning curve had uh, flattened out. I learned about as much as I could about running a, uh, a magazine business. Uh, WET was, uh, even though it was popular, it was popular among a rather small group of people, and uh, it was a it was a, sort of as a decision I had to make between making it more general and diluting it or, uh, or basically fold it, and I decided to fold it. And uh, went on to other things. That is... Uh, oh, wait, now that's oh. not all, is it? Well, it really is. What about... The, what about <laughs> yeah, it really is. Hold uh, on, hold on. What yeah. about the undesigning bath aspect of oh, your life, well, too? Oh, um, well, yeah, I, I uh, subsequently uh, went... Uh, Bathing, uh, there was a, always had a tug on me. And I felt that I had, uh, uh, I wanted to say more about it. So in the, the first slide I showed was a book called Wabi Sabi for artists, designers, poets, and philosophers. And after doing that book, I wanted to um, explore bathing through that um, aspect. I wanted to, something quieter, uh, more uh, basic, uh, the primordial aspect of bathing that I thought wasn't represented in, uh, certainly not among contemporary architects. And I wanted to see if there's a way that uh, uh, we could design baths that had this um, elemental pull on us, this you know visceral uh, profundity that uh, uh, the bad, some of the bads that I'd seen and some of the bads that you've alluded to in the talks here earlier today uh, had. And so I, I, had, I had a couple of ideas about how that could be affected and I put it in that book. And I also did a rather uh, cute book, I'd have to say, called How to Take a Japanese Bath, which um, it's not appreciated in this country, but I got a rather notorious uh, manganist, that's a person who draws Japanese style comics, in Japan who specialized in sex and violence comics, but who had a very beautiful lyrical uh, uh, drawing style to do a book of basically how to take a Japanese bath. Now, Japanese bath is it's not steam, but it's approached with the same reverence, I think, that the sauna is. You enter, and I thought it was interesting, um, what uh, the president of uh, the uh, sauna society said that the, uh, you enter the bath, the Japanese bath, clean. I mean, you the, the tub. And uh, I didn't actually know this about the sauna until today, uh, that it's, it's not the uh, sort of lower order bathing functions that we think of when we take a shower here in America. You just go to get off the grime and grease. Um, so uh, how to take a Japanese bath was a little bit, it, it, it explained a something, a somewhat mystifying act for people uh, who go to Japan for the first time. They go to a public bathhouse and they see it. They see people doing these strange things. Well, how do you do it? Uh, I was mystified the first time because there's a few steps in the ritual. And one thing I wanted to say, the last thing I'll mm -hmm. say, is that um, uh, one thing that's great about the sauna that I've seen here today, and I think it's been stressed a lot, is that there's a communal function to it. And um, I heard somebody say that uh, recently, they, in the, one of the presentations, that there's a public bath on every bath corner in Japan. Well, this sadly, this is not true. Mm. It used to be. Mm. And uh, every decade, uh, the, it, the, the public bath culture in Japan has been decimated. And uh, there's just a small fraction of what existed when I first started going to Japan. Um, private bathing has replaced that, that uh, people have uh, uh, little, their own little showers or their little tub. And it's replaced a very, something that had a very vital function in the society. And uh, I, don't, I think it, uh, I, I don't see it uh, any way it could go the other way unless there's such privation in the culture that uh, uh, people have to start doing things communally. But it doesn't seem, seems like a stretch from now. 
Okay, so I just I have to jump in now because Leonard and I we we've been neighbors. I, I actually he published me in Wet Magazine. We go back a long ways. But one of the things that I, I so much enjoy about sitting down and talking to Leonard is that we sometimes get in kind of arguments about things. Uh, and I enjoy that. We have different points of view. But do you remember what you challenged me with the other day? You said something to the effect of, you know, what is basic about bathing? What, what, what's so important? What, what's the value of bathing? Uh, and, and is it something that if we took it off the table and it just didn't have it, would it, would it make a difference? Would it matter in the world? And I, I kind of jumped back in with, with my thoughts on it. Uh, and, and being that I think it is something that is fundamental, and I've thought about it, because you always do this. You challenge me, and then I go out and think about it later. And, and I did some research, and in fact, I mean, the, the idea of cleanliness is probably something that is almost it's in our DNA. Because the function, our body is, in a way, we are an elimination machine. We are, we're, without us doing anything, we're constantly trying to make an equilibrium between uh, you know, health and, and unhealth. And our body is, through the elimination of process, uh, through many internal functions, we're always cleaning ourselves automatically. And so cleaning ourselves physically is just an extension of what's going on internally anyway. So I think it is, it does function on that kind of almost, you know, basic DNA level. And therefore it is something that couldn't be taken off the table without, without serious damage. No, I, I agree. I think everybody here uh, acknowledges and, s and many people have said that uh, the cleansing function, even when we sleep, you know, the, the hypothesized uh, yeah. purpose of, of sleep is we need to clean out. We mm -hmm. need to clean out. We need to uh, 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 unplug ourselves from uh, uh, life. The, the only thing that, that, that struck me during all the talks here today was that we talk, it's been talked about, well, we go to the sauna for two and a half hours and to experience uh, one kind of reality. Yet we, to the decisions we make about the world and the, 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 the quote unquote real world, we're making in the other uh, you know, 22 and a half hours of the day. So if we had the sauna mentality in the 22 and a half hours a day, and then we have the, uh, the, the kind of crass, vulgar mentality that we run the world with normally, <laughs> the other two and a half, two and a half hours. I we, for you. <laughs> it, it's, it's a much better, it would be a much better ratio. We'll, we'll work on that. Okay. Yeah, that's why we're here. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you. <laughs> I'm letting you off the hook easy. Does any, anybody? Well, I think there were a few points. Yeah. I'm sorry.